This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. We're back with another episode of the Sideline Slice alongside Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cooty, and um, oh man, just another heartbreaker. And uh, Searles, I guess for me, what, what felt a little bit crazy on the sideline is it felt like Nebraska was in control of that game the whole time and you just felt like they were going to get over the hump and then just a couple of heartbreaking plays at the end and and here we are another tough heartbreaking loss. Yeah, it's hard for me to call this a heartbreak because it was a self-inflicted heartbreak. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, a lot of times you talk about a heartbreak, it's a a ball didn't bounce your way at the end or you know, you came up just short on that third and one, but when you have five turnovers, you're asking for heartbreak, right? Yeah. You're 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 putting your heart out there on a silver platter and going, "Stomp on it, please!" Like you're you're just leaving it out there, and it's become such an issue now that it's almost like the self manifestation. You know, I was talking to Kyle Rudolph, who called the game on Peacock, which was interesting to watch the game on Peacock, by the way. But nevertheless, I talked to Kyle Rudolph before the game, and I was talking to him, and he's like, "Man, you guys look like you might turn." I was like, and I literally told my guy, "If we can take care of the football, we're going to win this football game." And he texted me right after the game, and he's like, man, it's almost like we're talking about it so much, and everyone in the program's talking about it so much. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're going to turn the football over. And we've talked about that on the show, and it's just one of those things where you're like, man, we got to get this cleaned up because, again, our defense played pretty well except for the last drive there when they drove down the field. And our defense is going to give us a chance to win every game down the stretch here, and they've given us a chance to win just about every game besides Michigan this year. And our offense just got to find a way to get out of their own way and take care of the football. Well, let's uh, let's talk about some of the positives. Uh, the starting with the ninety-plus yard drive that Chubba Purdy, the third-string guy, comes in and is able to take the offense on after Heiner Carver gets hurt. Jeff Sims has the third turnover, so here comes Chubba. Hasn't gone through many reps, but I thought arguably that was one of the best drives of the season that Chubba was able to take him on. Unfortunately, didn't end in points, but as far as just driving down the field and the different looks that they were able to do and, and, you know, he makes on the bad snap, makes an incredible play. Just, um, you know, there were just lots of positives, I think, to take away from that drive, despite the interception at the end. Yeah, and the, the issue is everyone's going to just see that for the interception, you know, and I reserve the right to judge Chubba Purdy. I know last year he started a few games, but until he can start a full game and get a full flow of a game under his belt, it's really hard for me to say, like, he's the guy, he's not the guy, he can give us a chance, he can't give us a chance, right? Kind of same thing I said about Harburg. You have to see how these guys operate when they have a chance to start from start to finish. And I think Chubb has earned that right. You know, if Harburg can't go because of the ankle or he's not going to be, Harburg is not good enough at like 85% to be better than Chubba Purdy at 100%, right? There's certain quarterbacks or even players that you talk about, like Patrick Mahomes is like, he's better at 85% than most backup quarterbacks in the league at 100%, right? Well, especially when what you do very well is run the football. Correct. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like his game is taken away when his lower half is injured. And so I think if if he's hurt, I think Chubba Purdy deserves the chance to go out and see what he can do to win a football game for this team, right? It's an evaluation piece for the staff. It's an evaluation piece for this offense. And it gives us a chance of what do we have to do with this quarterback room next year, right? That we have to start looking to next year for these quarterback rooms based off the performance that we've gotten. I would love to see Chubba get a chance because he did operate well. He made some plays with his legs. He's a little faster than I gave him credit for. And let's not forget, his brother's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL right now. So let's give him a shot. You know, I'd love to see what he can do. Not taking away from Jeff Sims, but he's just been a turnover machine this year. And I think Rule knows it. We all know it. I think he knows it. You saw the way that he was just so beat down on himself after that last turnover that he had. But in order for the betterment of the team, I would love to see Chubba Purdy this week. So, and and we heard Mar- Marcus Satterfield today saying that it was Chubba and Jeff taking the reps Harburg's out there doing mental reps, but they're trying to get all three of them ready. How does that work for an offense when you have the issues that this team is having and your now starter is hurt and then you had the issues with the turnover? I mean, what what is that like going through a week of preparation with knowing that potentially all three quarterbacks, we got to get all three quarterbacks ready to go? 
it's a weird thing because usually you're relying on your quarterback to be the guy, right? The trigger man, the guy that makes the whole thing go. He's the key that makes the car go. But when you have the issues that we've had at quarterback and you've had kind of a revolving door back there and none of them have really taken huge steps to go, I'm the guy and lead, it falls on other people in the offense to step into that role. And, you know, as weird as it may say, it's going to fall on the young guy, Emmett Johnson. He's going to be the guy that needs to fall in the role and go, okay, we need you to be the fuel and the key that makes this whole offense go, right? Fedoni, we need you to step up in your blocking. We need you to step up in your pass routes and help us go make plays, right? It falls on other people during the week, and that comes from Sat and Rule really pressing into this offense and going, guys, when it's the next man up mentality, but in just a different way. Someone like, yes, our quarterback got injured, but all three quarterbacks have not been super reliable, so who is going to step up to the plate and carry the load and carry the burden that a quarterback usually has to carry? And I'd love to say that the offensive line can do it. And I do think I echo Matt Rule's um, comments that they played very well against Maryland. You know, they had times where they protected well. They were pushing guys around in the run game. So I'd love to see us lean more on that offensive line. I'd love to see Teddy and Nuri really start to come back into their grooves. And then I'll just keep handing the ball to number 21. And when you prepare like that, it takes pressure off the quarterbacks as well. Right. When you're prepping all week going, hey, as a quarterback, oh, man, I don't have to make something special happen every play. I'm relying on the 10 guys around me. It takes some pressure off of them. Well, which hopefully then allows them to play a little bit more free. Allow them not to worry about is this an interception? Am I pressing the ball? Am I doing too much? And just start playing within the flow of what Satterfield wants from his offense. So let's, you mentioned Emma Johnson. Let's talk about him. And boy, you want to talk about the next man up and him taking advantage of that opportunity. And I feel like every week we're seeing him get better. I talked to Ben Scott after the game and he just was going on and on about how much respect he has for him, how much he continues to get better, how much they love blocking for him. And I guess, so from your perspective, how do you see a guy, I mean, he's a redshirt freshman, but didn't play at all last year. When that just you you get those opportunities and those the light bulb continues to go off and you just more you get better and better each week. How does that that process process work for a young running back? Yeah, you know it just comes with time and reps and trust, right? You talk about an offensive line and the running backs. And you talk about some of the great running backs that have played this game, and from college and NFL. All of them just have trust in their offensive line and their tight ends that they just can trust their run read and they're not trying to create too much. And that's one thing I'm starting to see develop more in Emmett is he's trusting, hey, if this is an inside zone or this is an outside zone, my aiming point is the outside leg of the right guard. I'm going to my aiming point and then I'm going to make my cut. I'm not trying to bounce it to the outside where I know there's an unblocked guy. Excuse me. Or I'm not trying to cut it back door too quickly you know that just comes with trust and and that ability and as you start getting more into the flow of that that's where the explosives can come because now a defense is really coning coning in on okay he trusts where he's going with this read we have to fill those gaps and all it takes is one guy to overflow or one guy to get out of his gap and then if Emmett can have that vision that he's starting to pick up that's reason be able to put his foot in the ground come out the back door when it's not too early not too late just the right time and make those big explosive plays how much have you liked Emmett Johnson and the job that he's done so far, though? You were talking about him last week. He was going to be a key. Yeah, no, I, he's going to continue to be a key. You know, when you talk about that running back room, you lose your two top guys in one game. And then your Big Ten back from last year who had a great year is having ball security issues. You kind of look and go, well, bud, you're all we got. Right. And you just kind of throw him and say, OK, into the fire you go. And he's really taken that in stride. He's really taken the opportunity to make the most of it. You know, he's had some issues, right? He's had a couple fumbles. There's a few reads that he's missed and a couple blocks that he's missed. But that's to be expected with a young player. But when you can have young players that get meaningful reps when they're young and you take your lumps as a team, it pays huge dividends off yet in years three and four when those guys are seniors and juniors and have played a ton of football and they're really starting to hit their stride. So I love the growth that I've seen from him week in and week out, and I hope to see him finish this year strong to carry some momentum into his next season. Another big positive and another guy that really popped on film to this coaching staff was Ty Robinson. And you've brought that up multiple times about waiting for him to really have that game where he was just dominant. And, you know, Tony White said today he was one of the best players on the field all game long. So what did you see out of Ty that allowed for him to have that kind of performance? He did it consistently. 
you know, that's the biggest thing with Ty is times this year he's shown up and played at this really high level. And then there's like quarters that'll go by where you're like, man, I haven't heard number nine's name called. Like, where is he? Where, where did he go? And some of that is guys are sliding to him and, and doubling him because he is the best D lineman that we have. But the mark of a great player is the guy that can show up on a consistent basis. And from the first snap to the last snap, Ty Robinson played with tremendous effort, tremendous technique, and just made a play after play again. And, you know, they aren't plays that necessarily show up on the stat sheet, right? He's a guy that's affecting the quarterback and getting him off his spot making him move or he's a guy that's getting around the running back right as a zero yard game and it's not a tfl but those plays matter and those plays are big when you start compounding them time and time again and loved seeing that out of tie you know a guy that has huge nfl aspirations he is another guy that needs to finish this year strong finish it well and he's a true leader of this defense as well and you look across that whole d line and nash and him and some of the other young players i'm really really pleased with a group that we had a ton of question marks going into this season with how they've come out and battled and how they've all continued to develop throughout this year and hats off to coach Knighton for that. You know, we looked up at halftime and, and Maryland had zero rushing yards and they still, again, uh, they continue to be dominant all season. They're still third in the nation in, in rushing yards per game and rushing defense. Uh, Nebraska is, what is it that is allowing them to be so good and dominant against the run? First of all, it's the confusion and the chaos that they create up front, you know, offensive linemen, when there's slants and there's moves and there's guys getting on different gaps as an old lineman, your he- your tendency is to hesitate, right? And I'm talking about like the other teams, the offensive lines, when they look at our defense, they're lining up going, okay, ties lined up over here. Nash is lined up over there, but I highly doubt that's where they're going to finish the play. Like where are they going? And you get into this guessing game. And when you're guessing, they're moving and they're beating you to the spot and they're beating you to the punch into the slant. So you're not getting movement, which then allows for those linebackers to have free flow because they don't have a big lineman up in their face and they're playing fast and free and they're just creating issues where an offensive line can't get in a rhythm, right? The only team that's truly gotten a run rhythm on us was Michigan, right? And maybe they were cheating. Maybe they weren't. I don't know. I'm not going to pass judgment. <laughs> you didn't but go there. I didn't go there, but <laughs> I'm just going to say Connor Stallions, you know, right here. But anyways, you know, so I think for for what they do and how they create, first of all, Tony White always has a great plan. And then just all 11 guys being able to execute. Because when it is a confusing defense and when there are a lot of moving parts, everyone has to be on the same page because all it takes is one guy to be out of their gap and it can be a home run hit. And that's been the great thing is the amount of pl- bodies that we play and the amount of people that play in Tony White's scheme, everyone's dialed in. Everyone understands what they're doing. And most of all, the the back end, the DBs, they're tackling, they're getting guys on the ground. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska, has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years. All right, let's uh, talk about Wisconsin. And uh, Wisconsin's lost four of their last five, coming off a loss to Northwestern, 24 to 10 at home. You have been a big fan of Wisconsin and Braylon Allen, especially Braylon's hurt. And they were pretty coy about what what his status looks like this week. Said he's, they don't know, he's day-to-day. He just, his body, he tried to go last week, but his body just didn't feel right. So only ended up with three carries. But he's he's one of the, when he's healthy, one of the better running backs in the country. So um, what is it that this team is doing that is, I guess allow has made for them to have so much struggles here down the stretch four of their last five very similar to Nebraska they can't get out of their own way penalties turnovers explosive plays on defense you know this is a Wisconsin team when I turn on the tape it's not the Wisconsin I'm used to seeing and that's to be expected because it's a totally different philosophy than what Wisconsin has been forever and always right Luke Fickle is spreading them out they're throwing the ball around they're trying to find their identity but I just don't think they quite have the personnel that Luke Fickle wants to run that spread offense, right? They're still built to be a Big Ten power football type of team with the personnel they have. And you're seeing the square peg round hole effect a little bit on offense where just things aren't clicking. And I do think Fickle's a good coach. I think he'll get it right. But we need to take full advantage of the fact that they're frustrated on on offense. And if we can come out and continue to frustrate them, you know, I give us the advantage in that based off they just have not been able to find a rhythm whatsoever braylon allen is their whole offense and if he's not and if he's not in then i don't know who they look to 
I know they have a good receiver in Chim DK who's had a down year in his production. He's always been a very good player for them, you know, and they don't have the Jake Ferguson's at the tight end position anymore where they have tight ends that are now in the NFL. Like they just don't have the personnel. I'm used to turning the ball, the Wisconsin tape on and seeing, and really this is a pretty even matchup in my eyes where so many times we were walking into a Wisconsin game going, man, we need something to bounce our way here. But based off what I've seen from the tape the last four weeks from both these teams, like this is a very much a coin flip game that's going to come down to field position and turnovers. What about their defense? Obviously, Northwestern was able to to get up on them early and kind of have their way, especially early, goes up 21 to three. What are you seeing out of the Wisconsin defense that the Nebraska offense maybe could potentially take advantage of? Yeah, you know, I think we have to run the football on these guys. You know, they're they're a team that has always prided themselves on being able to rush the passer. They put great pass rushers in the NFL over and over and over again. And they want to live in third and long and get those pass rushers a chance to turn and go. And so I think for the way Northwestern has success, the other way that Illinois had success is they were very good on first down and getting themselves into that third and manageable position. So in order for the Husker offense to get themselves into them playing their game, the Huskers, not Wisconsin, be able to play their game on defense. It's going to all come down to our efficiency on first down with running the football. You know, I'd love to see us maybe not pass the football once on first down if we don't have to, besides maybe a play action deep shot. You know, I'd love to see us just make sure we stay ahead of the sticks, give us a chance with the quarterbacks that are banged up. The last thing you want to do is put them against this defense in third and long. So they're five and five. And again, here we are another week with the Huskers everyone's trying five to get and five. I feel like everyone's five and five, right? <laughs> Isn't everyone besides Iowa five and five? Yeah. Um, yeah. But here we are again, another opportunity for Nebraska to, to try to get to a bowl game. Wisconsin's still trying to get to a bowl game, their final home game. It's prime time at night. What are the emotions right now for both these teams going into this? And, um, you know, how do you approach it knowing that there again, there's still so much on the line, but your chances are getting fewer and fewer. Yeah, you know, senior day, senior day on the road is a tough environment, you know, because guys are emotionally charged. The fans usually show up in full support because it's the last home game, a night game. So that means Wisconsin gets rowdy. Have you been to Wisconsin for a night game, Jess? I haven't been to Wisconsin. Oh, buddy, it gets rowdy. And I mean, you're driving up to the you're driving up to the game straight down fraternity row and like dudes are hanging out the windows like animal house. I mean, they get rowdy and that place is going to be rocking regardless if they're five and five or not, just because it's a game day type atmosphere as a night game. And we are going to have to weather the storm initially because they're going to come out fire and ready to go just based off all the emotions that are there. So if we can weather the storm, then I think we need to settle ourselves in and not allow ourselves to fall behind, right? You talk about our offense struggles with it is. We fall behind two scores, we're in trouble, right? We need to make sure we stick with them in that first quarter, whatever, whatever it may look like, and maybe even try and go take a lead early on to try and take the whole wind out of their sails that they'll be flying high on in order to do it because this place is a hard environment to play in. It was our first Big Ten game ever and back in 2011. It was college game day and Russell Wilson beat the brakes off of us with mm -hmm. Monty Bell. Like they'll be, they'll be singing karaoke in the fourth quarter. Like it is a very cool college football environment. That being said, we got to make sure we're locked in on offense. Got to make sure we're locked in our defense because it's going to be loud. Got to make sure we get our checks, get our calls and everything in. Zero operational penalties or else we're going to be in trouble. So you're part of the the crew that has never won, never been able to win in Madison. How much do would you like to see personally Nebraska walk away with a win oh, walking out I of there? I I know we said like you said I like Wisconsin. That's I bet you like term. Braylon Allen. I like Braylon Allen. Yes. I loathe Wisconsin. Yes. Like I I <laughs> I hate them. I'll just say it. I hate Wisconsin, right? Like they have dealt me the worst loss in my entire football career in a big 10 championship game. After we beat them in the regular season here at home, I don't like them. And so this team to go get bowl eligible in Matt rules first year in Madison. Oh, I'd be, I'll be singing straight from the deer stand. Cause that's where I will be. <laughs> when I listen to this game, I will be in, I will be in a deer stand. And so if they can find a way to pull that off, man, I would be so ecstatic for this team. And I do think that this could be a springboard into a momentum second year with Iowa, right? We still have to go through Iowa, but winning your last road game. Wait, do we go to Iowa? Yes, we go to Iowa, right? No, I was at home. I was home, right. Yeah. I, that's what I thought. Okay, my brain scrambled. But if you can win your last road game, that gives you a ton of confidence going into the offseason, right? Because you can, if you can win your last road game, get bowl eligible, and then go find a way to beat those 
pig farmers to the east and find a way to like get into a, a good bowl game at seven wins man you talk about some momentum in recruiting momentum going into spring ball so much of it rides high but it all starts on madison on saturday night We'll see some of the Iowa hate for next week, okay? Oh, there's plenty of Iowa hate to go around. You <laughs> kidding not, me? We, we could hate, we could Iowa that. hate 24/7, 365. <laughs> that's that's not a difficult thing to do in the Searles household. Okay, well, let's get to some keys. Your keys for a Husker victory. You want to guess number one? Take care of the football. Thank you. Take care of the football. Zero turnovers. I'm still begging for it. I'm just I'm begging for it. You know, I, I need to see it. I think we have the opportunity to do it. Just got to take care of the football. I loved our ability to take the football away last week. You know, that was big time. Javon Wright had a monster game, like super excited for him. Like he was going to be my game ball if we won, um, you know, but take care of the football. Um, be clean in the penalties. You know, I think this is a game with two offenses that are struggling that the penalties and that hidden yardage is going to be really important because if you end up getting a first and 15 or a second and 12 type of game where you're behind the sticks, it's going to be really hard to overcome those things. So really, really make sure we key on, on trying to have very limited un, self un, un golly, very limited self-inflicting errors, right? I'm talking about like the false starts, the too many men in the huddle, the delay of games, like you're going to get a holding PI. Those happen throughout the game but limit our self-inflicting penalties on the operational side. And then lastly, play physical. You know, Wisconsin's a physical football team. That's what they've built themselves on for so long. It's always been like Wisconsin is what Nebraska wants to be, right? I was so sick of hearing that when I played and so sick of hearing that when I watched them because it's like, no, no, we, we can out-physical them. And I really do believe that this team can really go out there and out-physical them. And I want to beat them up physically. And if we can go out and beat them up and control the line of scrimmage, I love our chances in this game. Who are your players to watch in this one? Whoever plays at quarterback, that'd be the first one, <laughs> right? Um, whoever's there, make sure that he knows how to take a snap, hand it off, and throw it to the right color. And then on defense, I want to see Javon Wright continue to have the momentum off his last game. He was a ball hawk. He made some tremendous plays in the past game, right? He's, his coverage was fantastic. His ability to strip out the ball. Love to see him continue to grow there. On offense, you know, I really want to see Fedoni, again, trying to get back into the mix. You know, he's been kind of quiet the last few weeks. I want to see him get back. I need him to be a better blocker. I need the tight end room in general to be a better blocker. They're a pivotal part of the run game. You know, so much of it falls on, oh, the O-line, the O-line. Hey, when it's a when you're in there and you're in line, you are a part of that offensive line. You are a huge part of that run game. I'd love to see those guys take a big step up, take some pride in their run blocking there. All right. Um, is jump around as good as they say? It's oh it's completely overrated. It's completely <laughs> overrated. Now I will say this when you're up in the press box, you think that old rickety rector set's gonna fall down. <laughs> like the whole thing's like going back and forth like this. But if they're winning and it's a close game, then yes, it will be fun. But if it's kind of a so so game, people are still out drinking from the halftime, it's not as fun as it used to be. All right, so going deer hunting this week. Yeah, I've already been out a few times. I took out my two friends. They both shot deer. I didn't, so I've cleaned two deer and shot zero. Um, but yeah, you know, par for the course. You par have, for the course. You've had for a rough year hunter. hunting this year. I've, so had far. A, I've had a rough two years of hunting. <laughs> you know, my buddy killed a bear two years ago, and since then, it's just been like the curse of the bear. We haven't been able to get it lifted off of us. So, <laughs> hoping to break the curse this week. You know, last time I shot a deer, I came in on Sports Nightly, recorded a pod. So I don't know. Maybe we'll have to do that again this week. All right, best of luck, and uh, we'll look forward to chatting again next week ahead of Iowa, your, your favorite team in America. <laughs> Go Big Red. Uh, for Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. Thanks for watching this episode of the Sideline Slice, brought to you by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers.